natural fortification buildings. Now look at it. It's in reverse slope in that direction and in this direction. So you've got to be right on top of it before you can fight it. It makes it immensely powerful. That and, of course, and all of the fortifications that have been done, or the, fort yeah, the fortification efforts, the field defense works that have been built by the Germans. They've been there for, what, two years now? Okay, the end of the attack on the 15th of September, the end of the first attack, four brigades attack, brings the leading battalions up to uh, Sugar Factory and Candy Trench, which is on the high ground just forward of the bus. And the uh, Candy Trench is a big, big defensive system that links Martin Puch Village, which is over there, through the trees, and Quilt Select. Turner switched on. General Turner, Command Second Division. He, he, makes, he orders a, a screen to be set up here by those two times from four brigades who have made it this far. He screened along the Candy Trench. He covered the advance of the 5th Infantry Brigade a part of the 2nd Division. At the end of the day, they're up here in Candy Trench, a quick fire plan, and the Van Dues and the, and the Brunswick Regiment, right? 22nd and 23rd Regiment, 22nd and 25th, right? yeah. storm across the low ground, across the low ground, into the village, get into it all night, door to door, <laughs> window to window, house to house fight. They are still finding Germans in the German soldiers in town days after the Van Dusen have captured it. That night there are 14 counterattacks. Germans try to get it back. You can see why this fortress is being fought over. It's the key to the second line, the German second line in this area, astride the Bapon Albert Road, which is the road we're on now. In Van Du lore, this is a big battle. This is the first big battle of the Van Dusen. It's not the first time they fight. It's the first big battle. It's, it's, it's the big reputation builder. Now the Van Dus are very typical, very typical of many infantry battalions in the Canadian Corps. They have an especially hard time finding soldiers, and even harder time finding French-speaking soldiers. So attacks like this are very difficult to recover from. What do they do? So those of you who are going to have the honor of serving in Fire Brigade in Valcarce, you're going to hear the words uh, Cursolet spoken rather often. The difference will be, you can speak about it intelligently because you've seen the place. So there it is. That's the Battle of Cursolet. Behind you, right, behind you you see a Canadian War Memorial. One of eight. One of eight memorials in France and Belgium. Three in Belgium, five in France. At the end of the First World War, there's a big contest amongst the architects and artists of Canada to design eight war memorials. Why eight? Because that's what they decided upon. There were eight battlefields in the Canadian Expeditionary Force which merited commemoration. And this is taking place while the French and the British and the Australians are doing the same thing. The first, first, the winner of the first prize, a guy called Allward, gets the first prize for architecture and he gets the first prize for his design of a war memorial that becomes the Vimy Memorial, which you'll see tomorrow. The second prize goes to a guy called Clemesha. His design is the Brooding Soldier, which you'll see Tuesday. The brooding soldier is supposed to become the standard war memorial for the other six places. Unfortunately, brooding soldier costs too much money to make, and this is the compromise. Klemesha, uh, who designed the brooding soldier, also designed these well, almost pillboxes. And they're at six different places across Belgian and French battlefields. In Belgium, they're in. Crest Farm. Brooding Soldier is there as well. Two there. And the rest of them in France. Courcelet, Bully, uh, Bouillancourt, Jury, Boron Wood, and the DQ Switch. Right. So that's where we are. Any questions on the attack in Courcelet? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to add something.
something about bayonets and, and bayonet fighting. Um, most of you that have done sort of the First World War um, history, you know, you probably read that whole business about the cult of the offensive, the cult of the bayonet, that these dumbasses somehow thought that a bayonet was going to car carry them across no man's land, that it was going to be enough, right? Well, no, nobody thought that, but the trouble is, once you get into a, a trench battle with a bolt-action weapon, right, I mean, they, you know, you're probably going to need something else, right, the, and, the, and the bayonet is it. And in fact, you know, even as, they, as we get better at doing our business, bayonet fighting uh, from 1914 to 1916 doubles, and then it triples into uh, the amount of time allocated to sort of a soldier's basic training. So people say, this is useful, and this is one of the biggest places for it, because mucking uh, the Germans out of those cellars and those dugouts in there requires bayonets, and it's a gigantic um, bayonet fight. I'll just read you an account of one of the, the guys who uh, about this bayonet fighting stuff. He said, uh, the fight at first, this is about Corselet, this, the fight at first was fierce, hand-to-hand, -hand, no weapons barred combat, bayonets, rifle butts, shovels, feet, teeth, all came into play. Blood spurted out of punctured breast, brain spilled out from skulls shattered by rifle butts. Bayonet fighting is, bit, is a bitter struggle to the end with no mercy shown. The sensation of driving the blade into the flesh between the ribs, despite the opponent's grasping efforts to deflect it. You struggle savagely, panting furiously, lips contorted in a grimace, teeth gnashing until you feel the enemy relax his grip and topple like a log. To remove the bayonet, you have to pull it out with both hands if it is caught on bone, on his ribs. You must brace your foot on the still heaving body and tug it out with all your might. In fact, you know, one of the drills was if the bayonet lug got stuck on the ribs, you had to try to fire around, break the ribs, and then turn it so that you could pull it out of the, uh, pull it out of the uh, body. But, you know, that whole business about closing with and destroying the enemy, that infantry stuff never went away. It's just that firepower had gotten to such a point that we couldn't even get into the trenches to do our jobs, right? And uh, like I said, and there's something about, I mean, even when we do trench clearing, you know, live with Terry, like live fire ranges, now you, I don't know, you put a weapon, you bayonet it on a weapon, and the guy's like, ha ha, <laughs> it just makes you a little fucking psycho. You know, and, and, I don't know how to qualify, but it's just it's a good feeling to have a bayonet on your weapon. I don't know why. You will be exposed in time to newspaper columnists, TV editorials, and history professors who say the bayonet went out of style. And they base that on hospital statistics from the American Civil War on that bayonet wounds just don't appear. Think about it. Bayonet guys don't go to hospital. That's why those statistics don't reflect beta wounds. And so there's, it's kind of a mis misnomer to read statistics saying bayonets have fallen out of fashion because, you know, the doctors just don't treat that many beta wounds. No, but the morticians treat the beta wounds, not the doctors. Let's go to